We're going to go over the nine questions you want to make sure you're asking yourself to be prepared in retirement. And we highly encourage you to seek a professional when looking at these questions, but we want to kind of talk about it because right. it's a big topic. Mm -hmm. It's a huge topic. Am I prepared to retire? Right. So the first three questions, because I want to get through three questions on this segment. <laughs> sure. Every segment, three questions. Yes, there every segment, we're going to do three questions. Gotta make sure. So the first three here is, what is your budget? The second question is going to be, what do you expect to spend in retirement? So what does my income need? Mm -hmm. And then third, how long will you live? So yeah. these are all very deep questions, but I want to start with the first one here. What is your budget? So Mac, Rebecca, how do we figure out their current budget right now? Well, first, let me just say that when people come in, 90% of the time, they can't answer the question of how much they actually spend after taxes yes. on an annual basis. They can tell you what their W-2 says. Yes. They can tell you. And then a lot of people, and I just will throw this out as a tax tip for everybody, um, you know, a lot of people conflate or mush together, we'll say, um, their Social Security and their Medicare taxes, their FICA taxes, and they lump that into their federal income taxes. Yes. Because they'll say, I'm paying so much in taxes, and that's just not possible right <laughs> now under this uh, 2018, right. uh, ta you know, 2017 that went into 18 tax and job. It's just not possible. The tax rates are literally the lowest they've been. You have to go all the way back to Reagan yeah. to get a, a lower top number. Um, so the taxes right now are extremely favorable. And so if you just look at the federal income taxes, you might have 15%, but then you're picking up another 7.65% on the on the the FICA side. So you're, you're, you just keep in mind there's almost 8% in payroll taxes that are separate and apart from federal income tax. Right. And don't lump that in, into the federal income tax in your brain because that'll make you feel like you're paying a lot more. There's payroll taxes are going to go, they're not going anywhere. They're, yeah. they're funding Medicare and Social Security. It is a pay as you go system. There is no trust fund that actually has dollars in it. It just has something called special treasury notes, STNs, which are basically IOUs from one side of the government to the other side of the government. So there is no yeah. trust fund dollars. There's $3 trillion of money that's been collected that has not been spent on Social Security, but that money has been spent. So right. the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government could use it for other things like any other tax, and so it has been used. Yeah. So the very answer to your very first question, because I could go on a tangent forever, is please at least know what your after-tax cash flow spend is yeah. when you're starting to go to a financial, have an yeah. idea of well, what you're spending. Right, and people don't understand that there's federal income tax, right. that's one tax. Right. Then we have state tax, right. Florida, we don't, right? right? right. Yeah, yes. yes. Then we have FICA, mm -hmm. and then we have FUDA. Exactly. So people are lumping all of those together, exactly. and they don't understand, oh, I'm bringing home gross 100,000, I'm spending 100,000. Right. Are you really? Right. So I, I love where this is going, and I'm yeah. I'm loving that that's questions one and two, and I can combine them for you. Yes, <laughs> love it. Have a plan, mm -hmm. sit down. We, I've, I've literally presented over 4,000 financial plans, and you can attest to this, uh, Rebecca, and you can too. Yeah. We sit down with folks, you ask what assets are, they know what that is. They know what their liabilities are, they know what that is. You ask what their income is, you know what that is. Then you ask them what their expenses are, and it's like, uh, er, exactly. uh kind of, sort of, not <laughs> yeah. really. So it's so important because that's a significant number once you're doing planning to try to move forward exactly. to it and, and try to hammer out. Right. And the second thing, gross or net? That, yes. and they're like, well, what do you mean, gross or net? No, what do you need to actually spend? Right. How much money do you need in your account? Right. If you can, if you can tackle that number mm -hmm. prior to getting into retirement, so you know specifically what we're budgeting. That follow-up question of what do you need during retirement mm -hmm. is a lot easier because typically they say what between seventy and eighty percent of your current income is what you may need right. during retirement right. because certain expenses go down, but. Gross versus net is a big one. Exactly. Understand right. what those two numbers well, are. And a lot of times we want to find out what are your basic bare minimum expenses. Yeah. Exactly. We can count on those. We know what those are. Right. We know there's miscellaneous expenses. It's hard to account for it. Mm -hmm. But if we can at least have some kind of number there, yeah. it's going to help us see what's the overall budget there. I mean, one of the easiest tools that we give uh, new clients coming on board is an actual very, very, very detailed granular budget uh, you know, software, and yeah. and that allows them to think, oh my gosh, we have like granularity down to, do you need to paint your house every couple of years and how much is that? Like we're looking at even expenses that only come up on a rolling basis every several years. Right. And I think a tool to have that to make your, oh, people forget their HOA fees often. Mm -hmm. They forget, you know, property taxes is built into their mortgage and when their mortgage is paid off, now they're gonna have that bill separate and apart and they weren't thinking that because they thought, oh, it's just my, my house is paid off, that PITI goes away. Well, no, the taxes yeah. and interest continue 
you. And these are the mm -hmm. things that a budget software that we leverage and give our clients as they become clients helps to really make sure that that planning process is exactly right. And I will say to Max's point, you know, we do like to know what you're spending right now, and I'll explain that in just a second. But also, we know that most people have their expenses go up a little bit when they first retire mm -hmm. because they're starting to pick up hobbies. That golfing is expensive, yeah. travel is they have expensive. A lot of free time. Yeah, they have yeah. the free time. They have to suck it up with something, and something usually costs money. There's there's not a lot yeah. of free going to the park and eating a picnic lunch out there, you know. <laughs> so we've got the the go go years where they're spending, spending, spending. Yes. Then we have the slowing down, the slow go years, mm -hmm. and then we have the years where we're really at the end of kind of life phases, yeah. and we we're happy and being content being at home, and we call those the no go mm -hmm. years. Right. And so we expect that the budget sort of changes throughout your situation. But what I've found is that people that are have squirreled away every penny, they come to us, they have a, a substantial amount of assets, and you know I'm trying to <laughs> trying to give them the biggest lifestyle that they. I'm like you you can afford to spend one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and they were used to spending you know fifty five thousand a year, right. and there's no way. And so I have learned over the years that if you have become a saver and you have become a thrift spend person and you've built up this great big retirement portfolio to spend, you probably won't spend it all because you you right. cannot, a leopard does not change your spots. If you've become a leopard as you've gone through life, yeah. you aren't going to all of a sudden become, you know, a cheetah. It's just not going to happen, you know. So we need to kind of keep that in mind too because yeah. people think that they're going to do this and they just aren't. I want to get through one more before we break. Yes, yes. So the last one would be how long will you live? That's the big one. Yes. That, that, the longevity, I, I look at the various aspects when you're in the retirement income phase of your life. You know, yeah. You've got Medicare, you've got market volatility, you've got all these various things. But the longevity is a tough one. Yeah. Because no one knows. There, there's no expiration date on our driver's license. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at true. least from the library. It's true. Your, your license may expire, but <laughs> your life, we never, no one knows. And so we have to continuously plan for what if we live to 90? Yeah. What if we live to 95? Yeah and stress test, and I think that's why having a plan and working with the planning software that we use mm -hmm. to be able to give folks a visual of what this could look like mm -hmm. if you do make it that far, yeah. and stress is really, I think is important. Yeah, Rebecca and Mac, I know we wanna talk about the next three here in this next segment, mm -hmm. which I'm gonna kinda of tee you guys up here. So the three questions are gonna be, the next three are gonna be, what is your end goal? Second question is going to be, what do you have saved? So the amount, how much? Third question is, where is it invested? What type of accounts are these? Because that's important for taxation, all of those other things. So let's kind of start with that first that first one. And I think, Rebecca, I think uh, this is, might be your favorite out of the, out of the nine here. It's definitely my philosophy, for sure. Yeah, so thinking with the end in mind. Yeah, always begin with the end in mind. I mean, that's planning 101, right? We, yeah. we, we don't know what we're planning if we don't know what we're planning for. So right? we have to define the goal, yep. and then we can reverse engineer. We're reverse engineers, that's what we are. That's why engineers love our practice, by yes. the way. Yeah. <laughs> they love us. I get so many engineers from we across the country that, that see the mathematical methodicalness of our planning process through the book, Wealth Unbroken, and they come. You know, but what I was gonna say is, um, you know, what have you saved? This is probably, the second question mm -hmm. is so fundamental because unless you're already retired, and, and it's over and you're no longer going to make any kind of active income. That's when we have to then be assessing reality and mm -hmm. say, yeah. okay, it, it's not gonna work for you. We've got to lower expectations. Mm -hmm. But if you're still actively working and you still have some time left, this is the perfect time to come in. I love people that come in when they're in their 40s mm -hmm. yeah. and they still have at least 15 years of work life experience left because that means we can fill gaps. Yes. And we do that gap analysis way before retirement so we can identify your time telling me you want to live off of $125,000 a year, mm -hmm. and of course we like to do after tax planning, after taxes, you're used to living off $150,000 right now, so that's that's within the realm of possibility, but let's see what you've already built and what that would deliver for you, and then let's mm -hmm. that gives us the gap, and then that's the gap we have to fill up for the next 15 years, right. and better come to us early and in advance, let's fill those gap numbers up in tax-free buckets, yes. legal domestic tax shelters, 
in the United States that we can fill up so that we know we can control tax as yeah. much as possible in retirement. So mm -hmm. please come to us before your five years pre-retirement yeah. right. and let us do this gap analysis for you and show you what you really have to do to achieve the goal by the time you retire. Well, even five years out from retirement yeah. is still a good time to yeah. come see us. Sure. We have so much with the tax planning we can do. Right. And and you say it better. I mean, it's it's we have opportunity now. Yeah. Let's take the bull by the horns and let's actually prepare for taxes right. in the future. Because right. if we don't, right. we could be sitting in a problem where we're kicking the can of that pre-tax bucket down the road and yeah. now we have all this IRA money that we have to spend down and we have to pay the tax on it now. Yeah. So Absolutely. we saw a planning opportunity even five years out. Yep. One of my personal and I love this three questions so much. <clears throat> A lot of times people believe, okay, I've got money. I've got nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And having a financial advisor or a, a, a go-to resource at that point to your, your point in your 40s, 30s, mm -hmm. when you start the, earn, the peak earning years, mm -hmm. typically are your 40s, 50s, yeah. having a plan in place removes a lot of doubt. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, you may be, okay, I know I've got this money, but uh, I'm not really sure if it's enough. Yeah. Come in, sit with the planner, go through the process, yeah. go through the planning process, go through these Monte Carlo simulations mm -hmm. yeah. and have the evidence and have the numbers in front of you because you only see what you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those things that we talked about before, right. the things you don't know, you don't know. Right. The planning process allows you to sit down, understand where you are today, and the more time you have, the better you have to implement some of these great strategies. Right, right. Tax-free income retirement, yeah. looking at protection strategies. So it's so important to know where you are, go through the planning process, yeah. strategize and look at what could potentially happen down there, and then that gets you a lot more comfortable. Yeah. Not just for you, but for your spouse, mm -hmm. for your kids, mm -hmm. for all those people that are around right. you that may be dependent they on are. the financial decisions They're that you're making. They're relying on you to, make, relying to know what you're doing. You. Well, exactly. And Rebecca, I know you had the client that came and saw us about five years ago and was yeah. like, hey, I need to retire in five years. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about this taxes? I'll let you kind of speak <laughs> on that on that client. Yeah. Those are always fun when they come in and they've got quite a bit of pre-tax money built up. And of course, as a tax lawyer, I'm just, I'm hyperventilating. I'm like, oh. Oh, this is a lot of pre-tax I have to deal with in the next five years. But you know what? I, I'm so proud of that family. Oh, they know who they can, are. Can you can you explain what what you were able to do? You know, we we had a situation where I, I had a, a doctor who basically uh, had an, his own medical practice, had multiple physicians yeah. working for him, multiple locations, had built up. You know, there's a lot of uh, once you get to start making a lot of money, there's a lot of advanced uh, tax systems that are uh, interestingly enough not designed around tax free, but pre tax. So yeah. something called a cash balance plan where you can uh, put up to you know over two hundred thousand dollars a year pre tax if you're a high income earner. And um, so a lot of doctors, a lot of law firms, a lot of these independent groups that are like multiple partners go with these cash balance plans. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to then they come to me and they're like, oh, wow, um, I, I, I see now that taxes likely will go up in the future based on where the United States is and, and their situation financially, fiscally. And I don't want to be paying these taxes the rest of my life as the rates keep going up and up and up. And that's yeah. what people need to understand. When you are in a pre-tax account, you're your silent partner is Uncle Sam and the Internal Revenue Service. That is the Treasury Department, U.S. Treasury Department, IRS's division of the U.S. Treasury Department. That is who is your silent partner. And when you start to realize that, I think he actually had found my book. A friend had recommended my book. He read the book. Yep. He said, oh, my gosh, this is exactly what I've done. By reading the book, he saw what you know that he had done this over with all of his doctors that worked for him. And he was like, wow. And so we had to really work to unwind yeah. that and move systems systematically over time money from pre-tax into domestic legal tax shelters and there are obviously the Roth is the one that everybody knows which we love the Roth but there are other asset classes that are even more favorable under the IRS tax code and so we methodically went through a plan and he had to write those big checks every year to pay the tax right. but literally when he finished he and his wife had no assets that were taxable they were all in tax-free shelters because over five years you were able to shield IRA money, yep. paying the tax now, mm -hmm. getting it into an after-tax mm -hmm. asset. Yep.
a, a, and a Total. tax free asset. So there's a yeah. difference. After tax indicates brokerage, right? And on brokerage money, you still have to pay the tax on the growth gains. and the gains, your capital yeah. gains. Um, and then if you have CDs or bond interest, that's ordinary income tax. People forget that. Yep. But interest income is always going to be at the highest tax possible, which is ordinary income tax. But so it's not after tax money, it's tax literally free. tax free money because not yep. only is that money that principal tax free, but all of its growth is tax free. Wow. And so that's like the tax whammy that we can deliver if we have yeah. the time for the planning. Yeah. So that, that's important. Yeah. Folks understand, you need to understand the type of assets you and that, own. That's our, that's our sixth question there. You, you to have understand to understand. Yeah. Because you have to understand, how am I going to get taxed in retirement? Yes. Yeah. I'm not going to have FICA or FUTA, yeah. but I'm still going to have federal income tax, maybe state income tax. So how do we prepare for that? And, and I've got to say, I just want to put a pin in that and just yeah. explode that like a bomb because that is the most derelict piece that 90% of financial advisors deliver because Wall Street a long time ago decided to divorce itself from tax policy and tax advice, just did not want the liability of financial advisors that don't really understand the tax system giving tax advice. Yeah. So they said, you know, we're not going to touch that. Go talk to your tax consultant, your CPA, your tax lawyer, your whatever. Go talk to somebody else, but don't look at Wall Street financial planning for that kind of advice. Yeah. And so I can tell you there's never been one time in all the years I've been doing this that someone has come into me and said, my financial advisor showed me that the tax projection in retirement is X, Y, and Z. That does not happen. People are not looking at the tax consequences of the yeah. assets they're holding, and they're completely blindsided when they, they get into they retirement. Know. This show's been incredible. I know we've already gone over six questions to ask yourself, are you prepared to retire? Yeah. And we want to talk about this last segment, the last three questions. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of tee you guys up, get you guys kind of thinking about these questions. So the first, this really the seventh, what has been your return? So mm -hmm. we're talking returns. Mm -hmm. Eighth, what are your fees? What are the fees that are you actually paying? And then the last ninth question here, are you prepared for taxes? Yeah. So let's kind of start with that first one there and really kind of talk about the return. So what has your return been? I think that's probably greater than 95% of Americans have no idea what the market has actually done. Yes. They have this vision of a 9 to 10% rate of return because they hear the market's done great since 2000 and they think, oh, this is what it's done. If you actually look, now when you add in 2022, the numbers change substantially and yeah. to the downside. So let me give you the numbers through 2020. So I'm just looking at turn of millennia 2000 to uh, 2021. Like I said, the numbers actually worsen if you add in 2022 for obvious reasons. Yeah. So let's just look at 20, 2000 to 2021. And a lot of people say, well, why 2000? I consider as a, as a financial expert that the 90s, the 70s, the 80s, they're all irrelevant because the world changed in 2001 when China joined the World Trade Organization and we all sort of decided to outsource productivity to Asia. Mm -hmm. So really only the 2000 beyond is relevant to present day. Yeah. And if you look at the S&P 500 from 2000 through 2021 without dividends reinvested, and you have to ask yourself, do I own every dividend paying stock of the S&P 500? Because if you don't, then when you look at the S&P 500 TR, which stands for total return, meaning all dividends are reinvested, you're going to get about another almost 2% yield over time from just dividends. So mm -hmm. don't think uh, you're getting that because if you don't own all of it, you're not getting it. And it's really only, it's, it's under five and a half percent of the annualized return absent of dividends from 2000 to 2021. And so I think that people have this expectation of this nine to 10, that's just not reality. Yeah. And when you look at a good 20 plus year period, you can see that we had the lost decade really from 99 to 2000. 8, 2009. It really, you know, was the very beginning of the of the new millennia. We had a lost day. It was the first and only time in the history of S&P where we lost 1% over 10-year period. So we had the lost decade. Then we went into the Housing Fair Housing Act where we really monetized subprime lending and mortgage-backed securities. Then we had the great global financial crisis mm -hmm. and we came back down. Then our Federal Reserve switched to modern monetary theory and has really been stimulating yeah. um, non-organic, non-repeatable, non sustainable Sustainable, hear what I'm saying to you, non-sustainable growth from 2009 up until present day of 2020. 2020 is the new era. We're in a new world since post-corona, and that's a whole new thing that we've gone well, through. And I love that you said unsustainable, because if you look at literally S&P from 2009 to the end of 2021, so yeah. we're not going to count 2022, 16% rate of return annualized. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. And you take that 16% and you add it to the front end of the last decade, and right. that's where you come up with an average of a nine. Right. But it's just completely unsustainable. America does not did not deserve to have a 16% return, and it did not have the corporations and the GDP of America did not give us a 16% return. What gave us a 16% return was modern monetary theory and the Federal Reserve stimulating the economy trillions of dollars over the over the decade of a period and yeah. cost of capital at federal funds at 25 basis points. We called that lower for longer, the lowest interest rates for the longest period of time in American history. And that is what it took to get a 16% decade. And it just is not going to happen again, yeah. unless it happens organically, unless America comes up with new AI and it's the future and we just take off again, like we did with some of our techs and the, the, the FANG stocks. Right. We just aren't there anymore, and it's not sustainable. Yeah. And I think a big takeaway from this, too, is the sequence of yes. returns. So, so Folks important. Folks need to understand yes. that when a, a planner or a report gives you a number, it's, a, it's an average number. <laughs> That's all we can do because right. we, we, we cannot project the future. Right. But understand that there are assets that you own in, 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 your, in your life, in your overall estate of portfolio that will have negative years. Yeah. And the sequence of returns is extremely important. So yeah. make sure that when you're entering to the retirement phase, yeah that you understand yes. that that account, though it could do this, also has the potential to do that yes. and make sure that you have other assets that maybe aren't defensive, defensive yep. protection and can provide maybe Risk a streamlined management. approach. Downside Risk management. Downside protection. management. Downside protection, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it's amazing. I know also we want to talk about fees too. I know we're running a little bit short on time, but fees are important to take a look at. Yeah. I'll say two things on fees, and yeah. this I'm a huge proponent of. There are two things we as mere mortals can control when it comes to our money. <laughs> the asset allocation, yeah. do we have in stocks, bonds, real estate, gold, and the fees. Mm -hmm. And we can control those fees simply because we, 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 we're very transparent as a firm. We yeah. tell you exactly what everything costs. Right. And you have the decision whether you feel that fees are valued to you or not. Right. Yep. And, I, and I'll just say, you know, um, there's a lot of robo advising now. That's kind of was a trend, a really big trend at least two years ago. And I think it'll come back, especially as AI really, the AI capabilities will come out and people will just be shocked. You could probably yeah. ask ChatGPT what our portfolio <laughs> allocation is in this day and age. But just know that you get what you pay for. If it's free advice, it's worth it.